it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. What would you say to the idea of a space force dedicated to the President of the United States? Last reported as a falsehood in September 2021, there are, still, no publicly known plans to establish a presidential space force. However, it is worth noting that space exploration and defense initiatives are subject to change, as is hinted at in tonight's epic story. Yeah, you've probably read the description of a guy like me before. I graduated from the Air Force Academy, top of my class. Got my choice of slots for undergrad pilot training. Ran track and field at the Academy. (laughs) Boxed. 4.0 grade point average. AM 490 course. Father was VCSAF. Uncle and Grandpa were both Magecom commanders. President's 100. Etc., etc., etc. Long story short, after flying Strike Eagles and Raptors for seven years, I was selected to become an American astronaut. But before my training was over, things began to change. About half a decade ago, a Homelander controlled Congress passed the new Space National Security Act in the face of severe disapproval from the Department of the Air Force, the Alliances, YPP, and FPML. The Space Corps created by the bill was from the outset designed to have a Marine Corps-like relationship with the Air Force. It would be formed over a five-year period as a staggered merger between the Army's SMDC, Air Force Space Command, and the Navy's SPA War, while eventually absorbing the Naval Satellite Operations Center the U.S. Reconnaissance Office, which in turn pissed off the alliances even more, and NASA's Astronaut Corps. Now this is where I come in. It was no secret among my class of prospective astronauts that the final neutering of the nation's storage space agency was just around the corner, creeping like a wild fox in a house of sleeping hens. The expectation was that we would be rolled into the Space Corps, either after graduation from training or just before its completion. Even after the Homeland Party lost control of both houses to a coalition of its rivals, the constant inability of that coalition to agree on terms when it came to most issues meant that there would be no threat to the space service's existence. The fact that, at the same time, the Homeland Party was able to secure the presidency cemented the inevitability of its ascendance. Our new commander-in-chief, mad Frank Monterey, the man famous for his fierce public championing of low defense projects like the F-35, ASAD development, absolute national missile defense, and countless others, had been a major investor in NASA's 21st century rival. Expanded resources and aerospace services, also known as IRAS, the company responsible for initial human moon-basing efforts, hand-in-hand in in cooperation with the China National Space Administration. The establishment of the Armstrong and Sea of Tranquility settlements was a source of renewed hope and lust for the future of the planet's surface. Although things were certainly tense at times, and while both nations were most definitely not friends, The Sino-American rivalry was seen by most in the middle at that time as fundamentally different from the Cold War. Monterey couldn't have disagreed with this sentiment more, although he hated them, and even campaigned on an anti-Chinese sentiment. He understood what the initial partnership era had created with the Chinese meant for the future of America in space. He also knew, when the time was right, that he would crush the proverbial throat of the Chinese space presence. As our class completed our required training, me and a few of my peers had been invited to a seminar held in wine country put on by the International Air Combat Study that would cover the future of space development and militarization. Attendees would include NASA officials, their Chinese and Japanese counterparts, senior officers and NCOs from the US Air Force, Space Corps and Navy, representatives of the People's Liberation Army, and, most significantly, 
the President of the United States. It would be here that President Monterey would attempt to humiliate and infuriate the Chinese delegation by announcing the American policy primer on Astropolitik on the last day of the seminar. In his closed-door statement, with PLA officers watching on in steely anger, the President made clear that the United States viewed itself as the arbiter of space and would only be at peace with purely civilian developments and endeavors by foreign nations. The message was now clear. The United States would no longer accept or tolerate the militarization of space by any nation other than itself. A Monroe Doctrine in Orbit, one headline called it that same evening. The anger felt by this announcement within China, and even in Japan, which hadn't expected such an announcement, was compounded by the events of the day before. The chief executive of Eras, and good friend of the president, had announced in an interview with Slice Weekly World the successful completion of humanity's first asteroid mining operation. About an hour later, a different Eras spokesman would quietly confirm over email with a reporter that the company would begin to gradually limit its cooperation with the CNSA with the eventual goal of cutting them off completely. This would most assuredly put the future of the Sea of Tranquility into question. A month before, the Chinese had openly condemned being abruptly left out of the New American Habitation Project, the colonization of the Kolodewski dust satellites, via the relocation of hollowed-out, previously mined asteroids, to Lagrange Point 5. The entire situation, when taking earthly geopolitics into account, was like throwing salt into an open wound, in an acid shower. The seminar was over. The damage, or progress made, was done. I stepped out of the back of my ride and into the hotel entrance where I was staying, giving the driver an extra tip before he left. The hotel was a nice one, by government travel card standards. All rooms featured a view of one of the two courtyards, one sporting a fire pit, a picturesque grassy couple of acres in the back adjacent to the pool, presumably for weddings, a small creek further back from that with numerous sidewalks for strolls, and even a bridge over the stream to a small park. Plenty of statues as well, the attempted style of which I couldn't discern. Perhaps they were going for an ancient Greek, sophisticated style to everything, but I don't possess the class or taste to reliably provide an answer. Behind the reception desk sat a young girl, likely in her early twenties, raven hair, brown eyes, some of the most doe-like I'd ever seen. She was quite distracting, actually. Those porcelain legs of hers, crossed and presented so minxily to those passing by her workspace, didn't help either. She looked up from her desktop monitor, saw me through her bespectacled gaze, smiled slightly, and called out to me, Mr. Connolly? I looked behind and around me for a second, I knew she was talking to me, but for some reason this little girl managed to slightly intimidate it. M Mr. Connolly, right? She asked again. Yes, I responded happily. She seemed brighter now, comforting me somewhat, as if she melted my insides with her grin. My guard was down now, and I somehow detected hers was too as I smiled back. Sorry, I have real bad hearing sometimes. Being around jet engines all the time can do that. <laughs> no problem, sir. I apologize for calling out to you like that, she said sheepishly. Not at all, gorgeous. I complimented her, the girl's cheeks turning red. Did you have something for me? I asked. Yes, sir. Some of your friends wanted me to notify you that the briefing will be within the next hour in room 241. I looked at her, puzzled. Briefing? Friends? What? Was it Lieutenant Jacob or Lieutenant Geyser? Why wouldn't they just tell me? Now she was confused. No, sir. Not those two. Um... 
the lovely girl fiddled with her post-it notes. Um, Sergeant Horace and a petty officer Gregory. Two women, she stated to me. Hmm. Two women. I don't... All right, then. Thank you. She smiled again. Of course. I hope all goes well. I turned as if to walk away, but caught myself and asked, Mind if I know your name? <laughs> don't mean to impose or anything, but I leave tomorrow, and I'd regret never learning it, considering how gorgeous you are. Now her face was completely flushed, and her smile nervous. <laughs> Poinsettia, she said quietly at first, but then clearing her throat, stating it again. Poinsettia. I raised an eyebrow. Mm, poinsettia. That's definitely unique, but lovely all the same, as you are. She laughed. <laughs> Thank you. You can call me Seti, though. That's what my friends call me. My mom was a florist and loves Christmas, so to her it made sense. I always thought it was kind of a jip, though. My sister got a normal name, Constance. I noticed the nervousness in her laugh as she said that. I reassured her. Well, I'd rather be talking to a poinsettia than a Constance right now. She looked down, flattered. <laughs> Thank you. And looked back up. Hope we see each other again. I responded back. <laughs> Maybe we will. Have a good night, Seti. And let her be. A little bit later, I'd finally gotten out of my blues and had a few drinks and asked Jakey and Geyser if they'd heard about this briefing. They said they had, but were told it wasn't until tomorrow. Also, the people who were going to be briefing them were two other females with completely different names. Zero warning, zero explanation. Something bizarre was going on, which put me on edge for the rest of the hour. The both of them came down with me to 241, just to be safe due to how weird it was. I knocked on the door. No answer. I knocked once more. No answer again. Just as we were about to turn to the left and back down the hall, a smoky but soothing feminine voice interrupted us from our right. Lieutenant. I looked. Two tall women in what seemed to be Class B uniforms both in skirts, which was becoming a rare sight in these military days. The one in front was Navy, with Petty Officer First Class rank. The one behind her was wearing the new preliminary uniform of the Space Corps. The Navy girl stuck her hand out. I'm Petty Officer Gregory. This is Space System Sergeant Horace. We were sent by the Strike Division to brief you. I looked at her with a thousand-yard stare for a minute. She persisted. This is about the transition. Oh, and other issues. She looked at Jakey and Geisel. You two don't need to be here, sirs. This is just for Lieutenant Connolly. They looked at each other, and then looked at me. Well, we'll see you, Mike, they said hesitantly. Uh, all right. I said back, uncomfortable. The room wasn't very well lit, just a single lamp in the far left corner providing the space with orange-tinted illumination. The redhead, Sergeant Horace, turned another one on near the table next to the bed. The petty officer motioned me to sit down as the sergeant collected some vanilla folders. The petty officer kicked her heels off by the corner of the bed and sat down next to me. She said to her companion, Jess, you mind stirring us up something? Yes, ma'am. Don't mind if I do, the sergeant affirmed. Oh, get the lieutenant something as well, she further instructed. He'll need it. I loosened my shoulders up a bit, staring at the documents enclosed on the tabletop. Just what is this about exactly? If it's about the transition, where are the Space Corps people I usually talk to? And why, uh, briefing, I demanded. 
She rolled her eyes slightly and drew some breath in. Look, sir, let me ask you this. Did your OIC over at the 50th give you any idea what this may be about? No, not at all. He just said we'd been invited to this seminar. The sergeant placed a drink in front of me, along with the soda coke can she used to make it. Oh, in case you need a chaser. I became somewhat offended at that implication. She laughed. <laughs> Sorry, sir. It's not like I know if you're a lightweight or not. I groaned at her. He hasn't told me jack shit, I reiterated. I see. I knew he'd puss out of telling you. This just keeps getting more and more curious, I thought. Jess, you mind? She pointed at the stacks of folders on the table. Mm-hmm, the redhead replied. She began to open them, carefully taking out what they wanted me to see and nothing more. Schematics, technical information, old Polaroid photographs, engineer's notes, performance evaluations, all referencing Detachment 3 of the Air Force Flight Test Center. Oh, dreamland. I said under my breath as my eyes were allowed to soak these images into my brain, all of them featuring a spade-like spacecraft, or what I assumed to be a spacecraft, and its mothership, which noticeably resembled the ill-fated XB-70, as if it were its forgotten love child from another continent. The former was referred to in these documents as the Black Star, Experimental Orbital Vehicle, while the latter was labelled as Brilliant Buzzard SR3. I felt like a little kid who found his dad's playboys under the bed. I had to forcefully break my gaze from it in order to ask her, Why are you showing me this? And why are you showing me this here of all places? Shouldn't we be in SCIF right now? She took one of the photos out of my hand. Sir? If you even try to think about this vehicle outside of this location without permission, you'd be halfway to Guantanamo before the neurons and synapses in your brain even knew what happened. The redhead piped in. You've been under careful watch since you left Cape Canaveral. We're both assigned to the Air Force Special Activity Center as its token space corpsmen. Same goes for certain people at the seminar. Waiters and baristas you've interacted with... Drivers. Petty Officer Gregory finished her sentence. Oh, and cute hotel receptionists with long legs and funny names. This situation is under our control, sir. This was a startling implication, to say the least. It felt like something was crawling beneath my skin. She put her hand on my forearm to reassure me and said, It's nothing to worry about, sir. We don't suspect you of anything. What we're about to ask you of is of grave importance to the national security and power of the United States going forward. I asked her, then just explain to me what the hell it is you want me to do. I take it you want me to fly this thing. She pulled back and took a swig of her mix as I spoke. Essentially, you and the other two are getting rolled into the corps sooner than the rest of your class from the mission you'll be undertaking. I'm sure you're already familiar with the upgraded man version of the mystery already, she asked. I said, yes, the MS-1B. The OIC has been quite excited about what we're going to be able to do with it once me and the guys are assigned to the Leopards. But she cut me off before I could finish saying the name of the squadron. Lieutenant Jacob and Lieutenant Geyser will be going to the 54th. Well, they'll be working with the B. You, however, will be going to the 7th Orbital Operations Squadron in order to directly cooperate with the Special Projects Division in the employment of the XOV. She took another sip of her drink as her compatriot finished her sentence for her with the word Major. Excuse me. I just made the list for Captain barely a few weeks ago, 
I explained. The sergeant shook her head and reiterated. And you'll be a major when you enter the corps. Similarly, Jacob and Geyser will be promoted early to captain as well. Consider it a compensation bonus for all three of you, in light of the risk you'll be undertaking when you're up there. Hmm. Risk? I mean, other than the usual considerations. What's so uniquely risky about flying this thing? I asked, unsettled again. Things were simply getting more and more bizarre. Oh, nothing in particular, the petty officer added. It's actually quite old. Never went into full production. Just a curious blackbird replacement the Groom Lake people didn't get much utility out of. They got tired of messing around with it, so as one of our first hurrahs into orbit, our young service is going to get to decommission it. Under fire. That's why we're promoting you, as incentive to take on the mission. We weren't considering it before the last couple of days, but due to exigent circumstances... It was found to be the most prudent option to offer it to you. Hmm, what the fuck do you mean, under fire? Are you talking about combat? We've only simulated space to space so far. Hell, we've only simulated counter space for that matter. I was beginning to raise my voice. She flattened her hand and gestured for me to calm down. Well, yes and no. She said softly, beginning to sound a bit more raspy in her voice. She tossed a few photographs of a Chinese space plane my way. These were taken more recently, as I inferred that they must have been shot with a digital camera. However, they were still incredibly grainy. I can make out a small space plane in the middle of a flurry of space debris and large rocky objects. The craft resembled the MS-1A but it was too hard to tell. Sergeant Horace interrupted my concentration. That's a PLA Shenlong, about 30 hours ago. What's wrong with it? Did we shoot at it or something? I asked. Yes, P.O. Gregory informed me. The 668th was directing a pair of F-15s out of California on a short-notice ASAT mission. My mind began racing. Were we trying to go to war already? So, um, you guys shot at it. Why before the president announced his new policy? I asked. She shook her head again, implying my assumption was wrong. We weren't trying to shoot at it. We were shooting at something else entirely. She tapped on an amorphous object barely visible in the background of one of the photos. I looked up from the enigma, my eyes meeting her piercing gaze as she spoke, as if she were a cold-blooded python consuming a small mammal. Sir, let's just cut to the chase. You're going to take this promotion. You're going to escort Jacob and Geyser to New America. And you three are going to kill the sole survivor stuck on that Shenlong. And you're going to do it all before that thing decides to kill you. Have you ever been inside a Colorado police station before? Here's a better question. Have you ever had to pick up your troubled brother from a Colorado police station before? If you have, you may be able to sympathize with my plight that day. I've been waiting there since one o'clock for him to be released. Our parents died about a year after I left for the army. We have very few relatives who cared about us. My parents were pretty much the black sheep of their families. So it was, of course, down to me to take care of him. It's probably for the best that it happened this way, I suppose. Being in the military, I get all sorts of benefits and on-base housing necessary to help raise him until he's an adult. Which makes one side of that equation easy. The other side, the actual parenting him side, well, I just don't know. He's 16 now, gets in fights all the time. I think he might be part of some anarchist punk gang that spray paints public property and vandalizes abandoned areas or some shit like that. 
I can't really keep up with it. We barely see each other. He's never home, I think. Well, I mean, I'm never home. I'd volunteered for an earlier transition into the Space Corps than the rest of my units, after being offered a lucrative bonus. I've been an E6 for three years now, and I'd say with confidence that I'm pretty good at my job. My military job, not my parenting one, that is. I suppose the military offered me that bonus for my skills in tracking objects and directing joint partners against spaceborne threats, <laughs> not my skills in guiding my brother through life and giving him a chance to feel like a happy, successful adult. I apologize for how depressing I must sound, but, well, I'm doing the best I can. And I'm starting to think the best I can do is not good enough. I feel like the more successful I am in the military, the more I fail my little brother as his guardian. The cops had called me while I was at work. The newest member of my section and I were going over counter-space academics, which is the term we use for the death by PowerPoint sessions we put our people through every now and then, just to make sure they still know their job. It's ungodly boring stuff sometimes. Basic shit everyone knows out of tech school. The NCOIC for our flight was droning on about one of the first anti-satellite weapons, ASAT, tested by the United States back when women were still wearing shoulder pads. The ASM-135 Bold Orion. Basically, a converted nuclear missile with its warhead taken out and replaced with a hardened microsatellite that would detach from it once in orbit and then proceed to smash into its target like a hockey player. The Air Force was even successful in taking out one of its own failed satellites with the 135, proving it could work. However, due to the death of the Soviet Union and increasing skepticism surrounding the strategic and defensive initiative, the project was quietly cancelled. That was, until defense industry executive and weapon designer extraordinaire Frank Monterey stuck his nose in it. Mad Monterey cried foul before the ink had even dried on the cancellation orders. He then proceeded to cry foul for over a decade after that. In the 90s and early 2000s, he would even buy late-night airtime on a few of the major networks to present his case for renewed ASAT development, and he... You guessed it, even an independent space branch for the military. Today, my unit is responsible for the direction and employment of the fruits of his labor. The General Systems ASM-270 Orion's Revenge. This one is not only faster than the 135, but it has more destructive potential as well. After passing through the mesosphere and into the thermosphere, its first stage detaches allowing a second stage to engage briefly for several seconds in a wild fireball. After this initial burst of flames is over, the rotors attached at the nose unfold from the missile's remaining fuselage like a parasol. Small angled tip jets located at the end of each rotor blade then ignite, allowing the weapon to adjust its velocity as it enters orbit. As it approaches the vicinity of its prey, the tip jets deactivate. At this point, the missile's rotors, made of a special hardened alloy, can be used to permanently damage or completely destroy whatever they impact. After a few goes, whatever rotors remain can be used to steer the ASAT to its final target, using its last bit of fuel, killing the adversary space object with a kinetic blow via the tungsten encased cone that constitutes its nose. Using this method, the 270 is capable of targeting a small constellation of targets, usually three to five objects, depending on size. Because of how it unfolds after launch, those in our unit have taken to calling it the Killer Umbrella. Sorry, I feel like I went off on a tangent there. We're supposed to be talking about my brother. His name is Jerry. Our mum named him that because, well, I'll be honest, I can't remember now. She told me once when I was younger, but I don't seem to have soaked it in. Let's see. I know. He skateboards. Well, I think he likes to vape. Maybe. I know he listens to that genre of music on the internet. Vapor waver. Something like that. That's probably why I think he vapes. This is kind of embarrassing to admit, but I'm supposed to take care of him. And I've been taking care of him for quite some time now. And yet, I don't know a thing about him with any certainty. 
I can talk for days about this missile I've only seen pictures of in classroom, give you every little detail of its development and even the politics surrounding it, but I can't be bothered to invest a minutiae of time into figuring out who he is or the kind of young man he's developing into. I guess I shouldn't blame anyone other than myself when he gets into trouble like this. It took me about 30 minutes to leave base and arrive at the police station. I walked up to the sheriff's deputy sitting at the front desk and asked him my question. Hi there, my name's Wesley Fairbeck. I received a call telling me my little brother Jerry had been arrested. The deputy looked me up and down, dressed in my OCPs, with new Space Corps regalia adorned upon it. He replied, Ah, yeah, the little skater asshole spat at me when they brought him and his punk friends in. I scratched the back of my head and tried to save face. I'm really sorry he did that. I think he may just have a lot of adrenaline and peer pressure going through him right now. He's really not like this. Right, the deputy said as he rolled his eyes, picking up the phone at his desk. Ray, it's Diaz. Skater asshole's brother is here to pick him up. He looked back up at me, noticing the name taped on my left chest that read... U.S. Space Corps. He joked to his friend over the line. Oh, scratch that. Buzz Lightyear's bottom bitch is here to pick him up. He began to chuckle as he threw the phone back down into its place, forming a shit-eating grin as he looked at me and said, Hey man, relax. I'm just having a little fun at your expense. He did spit at me after all. I kept back the urge to throw my fist through the glass that separated us. Right, I said back to him. So, I take it he's not being charged with anything. He said, That's right. One of his little friends was the one who actually assaulted someone. With a knife, no less. From what the victim told us, your brother tried to calm things down. Anyways, you can have a seat over there while my friends finish questioning him. He pointed to rows of wooden chairs behind me arranged to face the bulky box TV that belonged to some other era of history. I furrowed my brow and said, Thanks, under my breath, trying to prevent my anger at this prick from swelling out of control. I sat down in one of the front chairs and checked my phone. I saw that I'd received a text from one of my troops. Her name was Space Specialist First Class June Alvarez, she was one of the many to be the first to attend Space Corps basic training at Lackland Air Force Base. Her text read, Sergeant, I know you had to go to the police station, but could you hurry back? The PowerPoint is over and we're back to work now, but I'm still pretty lost on some of the telemetry stuff you were showing me earlier, and no one really wants to help me at the moment. I texted her back. I'll be as fast as I can, but these cops are being assholes right now. Go get Sergeant Flores. I know she's studying for her level 7 test, but if you are in dire need of help right now, she shouldn't be too mad that you're interrupting her. I sat back and stared at the blurry, horribly antiquated machine in front of me as it spewed out ad after incessant ad. One featuring a beautiful, young, bikini-clad blonde sipping a soda coat on Mr. Conga line on the beach. Introducing soda coat line. The voiceover said, The familiar taste that America trusts with a refreshing twist. Another featuring footage taken from the Armstrong moon base, with the Eras logo in the corner. Finally centering on the company's CEO with a drink in his hand as the music from 2001 plays in the background. This time the voiceover said, Mental is now the official soft drink of Eras CEO Hood Fisher. What's yours? Get mental or get out. Finally, a less annoying one appeared after that was over, this time featuring supersonic airliners elegantly passing through clouds set to the tune of a soothing score. The voiceover asked, With a safety record and time to destination like ours, just remind us again, why wouldn't you fly Air Virginia? After that hell of hokey commercials was passed, the news returned. The commentator was grey-haired, bespectacled, and wearing a dark blue tie, signifying his well-known outspoken support for the Alliance Party. 
Breaking at the top of the hour, our coverage continues of the situation in the Indian Ocean as it now appears attack boats belonging to the New Indies Construction Front have besieged a Navy hospital ship attempting to relieve wounded and dead from evacuated American and Allied forces that escaped Diego Garcia last week. We then proceeded to go into a long rant about the President and the Homeland Party while talking over a reporter who was live from the scene. The TV signal must have become distorted somehow because eventually I couldn't understand a word he was saying. It was as if he was mumbling. The picture on the screen blurred out even more, making the images depicted indiscernible. I began to feel weird physically, lightheaded. I'm not sure if it was the stress of the day or the fact I'd been sitting there for a while or what, but I had this gnawing sense of danger in the pit of my chest. The room became bright, and for a second, I thought I saw some sort of indescribable shape appear out from behind the TV. All of a sudden, I heard a voice speak to me, not from any direction, but as if from all directions. You must wait to hit your target until 1935, no later. Do not let the girl with the long legs see what you are doing. I woke up out of my trance, shouting, What? as I realized nothing was behind the TV. I was in a cold sweat now. I felt as though I'd just woken up early in the morning. I looked outside. The sun was beginning to go down. How long was I out? Was I out? The program I was watching was over now. The blue-haired woman with the FPML button on her lapel was on instead. Knowing that she comes on quite a few program slots after the old guy with the dark blue tie, I inferred that I must have napped for... four hours? What the hell? I said out loud as I quickly took out my phone. It was dead. Not good, I said to myself. Just then the door to the detention area opened. I turned my head and saw Jerry. All right, we're done questioning the little punk, the deputy from before said, pushing Jerry forward into the waiting room. He was holding his favorite skateboard in his hand, gifted to him by our dad many Christmases ago, now broken in half. Jerry turned around and gave him the middle finger. Lick my ass, pig. I shouted at him. Jerry, knock that shit off. What the hell's wrong with you? He turned and saw me, now becoming even angrier. Everything became silent for a moment. Finally, he spoke up and said, can we just get the hell out of here? I'm tired of smelling pork. He looked back at the cop and gave him a scowl. I grabbed him by the shoulder. Be quiet so we can leave, moron. He flinched and brushed my hand off. I don't need your stupid ass advice, he said angrily, and walked through the doors outside to the parking lot. I followed him. As he approached my truck, I unlocked it for him so he could get inside, but before he did, he slammed the remnants of his board into the bed of the pickup. I yelled at him again. Could you not throw shit around like that? This is my truck. I paid for it. It's what gets you to school. He yelled at me in turn. Oh, could you shut up for once? God damn it, you're so freaking annoying. Slamming the passenger side door on me before I could say anything back. Not wanting to take this any further, I walked around to the driver's side. As I started the engine, I remembered from before that my phone was dead. I plugged into my car charger. I noticed then Jerry had a tear rolling down the side of his face. I know he must have been upset by the whole ordeal. I tried to speak to him, beginning to verbalize his name, but before I could get anything else out, my phone reactivated and alerted me with a series of text message and missed call alerts. My attention was fixated on that now, as I realized I'd missed over 30 text messages from seven different people and 18 phone calls from Alvarez, Flores, and my NCOIC. I opened Alvarez's most recent message. Sergeant, where are you? The NCOIC has been trying to call you for two hours now. He needs you to get down here quick. I'm not going to say why, because OPSCC, but get down here, please. 
I let out one long fuck as I read that. Jerry wiped his face with his shirt and asked, What now? Without answering, I bolted the truck out of the parking space and started driving back to base, twenty or thirty miles over the speed limit. Jerry kept trying to ask me questions on the way there, realizing there was something wrong, but I refused to talk to him. I just kept dropping F-bombs over and over as I swerved in and out of potential car crashes on the way back to squadron control room. We finally got to the gate and I hurriedly took out my CAC card and gave it to the security forces guy standing outside my truck. The airman scanned it and said, Here's two, please, pointing at Jerry. I screamed at my brother, Come on, give me your goddamn ID. He screamed back, All right, calm down, Jesus. The airman looked calm as I had my episode. I gave him the ID to scan, and he led us on our way. Arriving at my unit's building, I cut someone in a muscle car off before they could take the space that I wanted. I left the windows rolled down, turned the engine off and hopped out. Jerry was still inside. He shouted at me, indignant. How goddamn long are you going to be? I cringed, turning to him as I took my wallet out, removing my CAC card and security badge from it. I threw it at him and said... If you want dinner, walk down to the BX and get something from the food court. I then booked it into the building. As I ran up to the polarized, bulletproof glass doors protecting the world of my profession from prying eyes outside, I saw the sign placed just before the steps, proudly displaying our squadron's battle cry below our new service's motto. The former read, We maintain the balance with the latter exclaiming, Secure the high ground. I pulled on the door handle, rushing inside as I was met with another security forces airman who needed to check my security badge before letting me through. After being led inside, I sprinted down the hallway to the control room where my workstation was. There were five people crowded around it. The NCOIC, Alvarez, and two women in Class B uniforms who were unfamiliar to me. Their nameplates read Hayek and Hayek Song, respectively, which made me wonder if they were siblings or something. The one with a hyphenated surname was an E6 like me, which is called a color sergeant in the Space Corps. The other one was an officer, O3, a captain. They were almost twins, I thought to myself, and extremely attractive to boot. The NCOIC looked at me and yelled, Where the hell have you been? I tried to explain, exasperated. I'm sorry, Sergeant. My phone died and I somehow got knocked out. He cut me off. I don't want to hear it right now. I'm frankly shocked you display this kind of behavior. We're going to have a long talk after today. I can tell you that much. Now, sit down and help Alvarez out. She needs it. Roger, Sergeant, I said, defeated. I sat down next to Alvarez in my swivel chair as he walked up the steps to where the commander and the other higher-ups were. Sergeant Flores was at the workstation in front of us, tracking something else. I asked the space specialist, So, what the hell happened? Alvarez explained. Well, after I texted you, me and Sergeant Flores started tracking one of these Chinese space flights they've been doing for a while now. I know they're just testing, but well, this time they went near New America. Two of them, in fact. It was kind of like that thing they did last week when they overflew Armstrong, but not as bad as that time they almost smashed into the damaged MS-1A we were monitoring. I asked... Okay, so what happened? Did they do something belligerent? No, she said. They've just been sitting there doing some EVA. Sergeant Flores is still tracking them. I think they're about to pack up and leave right now, actually. I was confused. Okay, then, what's the problem exactly? I demanded to know. She groaned. That pointing at the big screen in front of the entire room. 
depicted on it was an amorphous object. I can't really describe it effectively, but it looked strangely familiar. It was black, resembling a cloak without a wearer, maybe. I'm not sure. I was looking directly at it, but it was also as if I wasn't at the same time. Like how things blur out in the periphery of your vision. And the this was smack dab in front of me. I asked, lost for words. What is that? She responded. After we were able to get a fix on them, Pine Gap contacted us. They wanted to know if we could check to see if there were any foreign space assets near one of our surveillance satellites that had become unresponsive. And that's when we found it. It wasn't doing anything, really. It was just sort of near it. We gathered some basic information about its position and size as it moved towards a commercial satellite in the vicinity. It stayed there for a while, but then it just darted out of view towards L5 without any warning. Um, towards the Chinese? I asked. She nodded her head. Well, what is it then? Some PLA weapon we've never seen before? I asked again. No, I... She stuttered. I, I think they're as confused as we are. As soon as it showed up behind the construction site for the orbital settlement, they stopped doing maneuvers and started observing it. It detached something just before you got back, and one of them got out to capture it, we think. But whatever split off from it seems to have disappeared somehow. I don't know. This is all very strange, Sergeant. I looked up at the women with similar last names. I leaned over to whisper in Alvarez's ear. Who are these two? Um, they're from Virginia or something, she said under her breath. What? I said. I began to feel as though this was way too much for a day like today. That's what I said. I think maybe they're intel people, but I'm not sure. But the thing is, they showed up with all this data on the object. Its usual orbit trajectory, flight path history, more detailed dimensions, frequencies it operates on. Tons of stuff we would never have figured out ourselves. It's almost like they've been tracking it for years. That's when the captain interjected. Talking about us, kids? My eyes widened. No, Mom, I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot my rank. She reassured me. It's quite all right, Sergeant. I know this must be a lot to take in. I don't blame you. She turned to her friend next to her and said, Constance, go chat up the commander for a bit. I think he feels left out. I have this handled over here. Uh, yes, ma'am, the color sergeant affirmed and walked off. The captain sat down in an empty chair next to me, crossing her legs and planting her heels on the desk in front of us. For a second... She managed to distract me. All right, <laughs> cut me some slack. I, I'm a guy, after all. But she didn't distract me for long. Her voice broke my concentration. Specialist, we're probably going to need you guys to start making some calls to get something scrambled here pretty soon. Yes, ma'am. I'm sending a request out to Norad right now, Olvarez responded. Good girl. The captain complimented or belittled her. I could tell it irritated Alvarez somewhat. Sergeant, could you double-check something for me? She asked. Uh, yes, ma'am. What? She went on. The commercial satellite the object interacted with earlier. Could you find out who it belongs to? Roger that, ma'am. I typed away at my keyboard, collecting the information for her. I pulled the satellite's designation up on my screen. Eras 12120, I said aloud. I cross-checked its name on the government's registry of civilian-owned space assets. Uh, it says it's owned by Eras, ma'am, but it has some sort of note under its listing. Let's see. Here, it says it's a broadcast satellite operated by Eras and and contracted out to a television provider. I lingered on those last few words. Television provider? My mind went back to what I'd seen earlier before. 
I wasn't sure if I should tell anyone or not. Hmm. Thank you, Sergeant, the captain said, and pulled out her government phone to begin texting someone on it. Just then, Sergeant Flores spoke, pointing at the screen in a panic. Look! The object was suddenly in front of one of the Shenlongs she'd been tracking. The other Shenlong, it seemed, was running away from the situation, leaving its comrade behind. How the hell did it get there? The NCOIC said out loud. Flores, are they still doing EVA? He asked. I can't tell, Sergeant. That thing's messing up all our sensors. I can't even contact the other monitors we have nearby. Wait, look what it has. The sergeant blew up what she was referring to on the big screen. It was a tungsten rod used for construction of one of the orbital settlements. It wasn't holding it, but it was as if they were orbiting the object itself, like it was its own planet or something. The captain stood up from her seat and started to sound a bit panicked. Holy shit. Sir, it's what I said before. It's going to conduct a kinetic strike. Probably for here. The commander nodded at her and took control. All right, people. It's the fourth quarter, and this is the ten-yard line with our backs to our own end zone. Sergeant Fervik, what's going on with NORAD? Alvarez butt in before I could respond. They just got back to us, sir. There's a couple of F-15s out of Oregon that can be ready to go in 90 minutes. Not good enough. We need something in less than 60, or we aren't going to make it out of this alive, he informed her. I looked at the information Norad had supplied us with and interjected. Sir, there's a pair of aggressors out of Nellis on TDY flying back from Miramar right now. Yeah? So? He questioned me. Well, sir, they're less than ten minutes away from Edwards at the moment. We could have them land there to be fitted with the 270s Edwards still has on hand. They could be armed and back up in the air within forty to fifty, if everything goes right, I explained. He looked unsure. He gave a skeptical glance to the NCOIC. Just before he could say something back, the captain intervened. Sir, this sounds like the best option we have at the moment. If the information I briefed you on earlier is right, then I don't think we have a lot of time on our hands to play footsie with NORAD all day. He looked over the room, contemplating her answer, reading all our faces. All right. All right, call them up and get it going. No more screwing around with this thing, he said with a cautioned tone in his voice. About sixty minutes later, we were ready to go. The F-15s had taken back off from Edwards and headed towards Death Valley at supersonic speeds. An AWACS from Norwad patched in their position to us and relayed a comlink with the flight lead. I had everything at my station ready to go. Alvarez would keep tabs on the project's movements, while I would guide the F-15s into position and provide them with the necessary targeting information to input into the ASM 270s brain. Captain Hayek would continue to observe and advise us from behind. I looked back at the commander for a quick second. He saw me and said, You got this, Sarge. Take this bastard out. I nodded to him in affirmation. I put the headset on and keyed up the comm link with the pilot. Breaker 11, this is Big Horn Control. Do you read me? Roger that, son. This is Breaker 11 and 12. We're packing heat now and ready to enter our climb, the pilot explained. That's perfect, sir. Object hasn't moved so far, and if it stays that way, we shouldn't have to waste a second shot. I brought the object up on my screen, taking note of the information Alvarez had just collected on it. All right, Breaker 11. Big Hong Control says you can initiate your climb. Please notify me when you reach Angels 30. Copy that, Big Horn. We should be there in about 15 to 20 mics, the pilot radioed back. The wait for them to get into position was shorter than expected, but grueling all the same. We were at 75 minutes now, with a gun pointed at our heads. The object stayed in place, 
tungsten rod still circling it like a late-night mugger with a knife in hand. My chest was pounding, throat lumpy, head splitting open from all the stress of the situation. Finally, the pilot radio back in. All right, Big Horn Control, Angel 30, awaiting orders. That's great news, Breaker 11. Pulling the target's orbital position up now. I then gave him the necessary numbers. After a small conversation between him and his wingman that I could hear through the headset, he responded again. All right, Bighorn. Breaker 12's telling me he's locked and loaded, he said. All right, sir. Hit Angels 32 and fire away, I informed him. The aircraft climbed a bit more. The sky must have been the darkest shade of blue anyone could imagine at this point, I thought to myself. The wingman screamed over the radio. Breaker 12! Fox 5! The missile detached from the centerline pilot of the aircraft, the F-15 breaking away and turning around back towards Earth as its first stage ignited. We picked the missile's location up on our side, tracking it on the big screen. At my workstation, however... I had more specific information about the weapon's speed, velocity, its ultimate target, and when its first stage would separate. I looked at the clock on my computer. 1908 hours. Again, I thought back to the events earlier that day. Something was gnawing at me again, deep in the pit of my chest. At this rate, the object would be struck before 1935. That should be good. But why do I feel like it's not? Perhaps it's the stress again. I'm sure, but... God, I can't. No, something isn't right. I can't let this continue. I can't let it happen before... Bef before 1935. I looked over my shoulder at the captain. She was acting as though she was watching the missile's flight path on the big screen like everyone else but I knew she was taking glances at what I was doing here and there. Why? Did... She... Did she know? How could she know? I hovered my cursor over the control for the missile's first stage. I typed in what I knew to be the incorrect separation point. My ring finger glided over to the enter key and stayed there. I looked back over my shoulder again. She was locking eyes with me now. I looked past her, glazing my eyes over, as though I let something inside of me take over my actions. Sergeant, she questioned softly. I don't think anyone else could hear her. Sergeant, she said again under her breath. I pressed the enter key. The first stage detached before the correct altitude could be reached. No matter what the second stage tried to do at this point, it would never be able to reach orbit, and was thus a failure. Everyone in the room began to scream, questioning what had happened. I threw Alvarez under the bus, saying that she must have given me the wrong altitude. She looked confused, and upset that I would betray her like that. Why was I doing this? What was wrong with me? Could it really be the stress? Captain Hayek didn't say anything, or call me out, but somehow, I think she was well aware of what I had done. I radioed back to Breaker 11, letting him know that the shot was a failure, and ordered him to turn round in order to reach 32,000 feet again. He affirmed and proceeded, but before I could relay the targeting information to the pilot like before, Captain Hayek spoke up. I think Specialist Alvarez should take this, Sergeant. Give her your headset. I... I didn't know what to say. The officer narrowed her eyes. I said, Specialist Alvarez should take this one. Sergeant, I don't want anyone interfering with our little game. She said it softly but forcefully, as though I were her errant child. I didn't say anything back and handed Alvarez my headset. The specialist took the reins, guiding the flight lead as I'd done before. Breaker 11, that should be it. 
you're cleared to fire as soon as you hit Angels 32. And, as before, the pilot called in his shot as he reached the requested height. Breaker 11, Fox 5. We could hear through the speakers in our control room. I checked the time again. It was 19.29 hours. Good, I thought to myself, though I still couldn't figure out why. The missile detached its first stage at the correct altitude this time. As it was designed to do, the second stage ignited and boosted the weapon into the necessary velocity for the rotors to take over. The tip jets guided the killer umbrella towards our anomalous hostage taker. We watched on the big screen as it tracked the kill vehicle's jaunt to the object's position near New America. I fixated my eyes on the feed we were still receiving from the surveillance satellite that had it in view. Just what was it? I looked back at the time on my desktop. 19.35 hours. I felt relieved somehow, but again, I didn't know why exactly. Just as I took a sigh of relief, Alvarez well, spoke up. The rod! It got rid of it! She screamed. Indeed, the monster loosened whatever invisible grip it had on the piece of tungsten, and it floated away back towards New America. It wasn't threatening us anymore, thank God. But we were still threatening it. We're not going to give up this kill. That thing tried to fire at us. Continue with the trajectory, specialist, the commander ordered. Yes, sir, Alvarez responded. Second stage kill vehicle is within range, icing tip jets. I'm going to go for a direct strike with this one. Three, two, one, out. Tipjects deactivated. We're still on the money. One more minute to kill. Alvarez had obviously paid attention this morning in counter-space academics. I was proud of her, as was everyone else in the room. Captain Hayek beamed at her while giving me the cold shoulder. The cold shoulder, I suppose, I deserved. But then, everyone's joy at Alvarez's accomplishment quickly dissipated with what we saw happen on screen. The object was back behind one of the hollowed-out asteroids of New America. It just suddenly wasn't where it had been. The remaining Shenglong, however, not so much. The missile was less than 15 seconds out now. The commander interjected. Fire the tip jets. Reorient. Move it out of the fucking way. Alvarez panicked, cracking her voice. I, I can't, sir. It's not accepting the signal. I can't move it. It's going to hit. She was beginning to tear up. The missile impacted the underside of the Shenlong with its rotors, veering off from it and being forced by its kinetic energy into the side of one of New America's asteroid habitats shattering the weapon to pieces and obliterating several facilities constructed along the front end of the settlement. Everyone stood up from our chairs, a few wincing and others letting out desperate screams as the impact happened before their very eyes. It was over. We had failed. Whatever that thing was had bested us. I tried to console Alvarez. But she didn't trust me anymore, and rejected any effort I made to let her know it wasn't her fault. I looked over at Captain Hayek. She just stared at me, not saying anything, and walked away. The NCOIC grabbed me by the shoulder as I sat back down, and informed me that my actions from today would likely be investigated by a third party, and that I should probably start getting in contact with Jack. Not only had I sacrificed the trust my apprentice had in me, but it seems as though I sacrificed my entire career for this thing. How am I going to be able to take care of Jerry now? I thought to myself. That's when I remembered. I left him in the truck outside. I got outside to check on him. It was just after dusk now. He was gone, with his broken skateboard and my wallet. Jerry, I'm sorry. I said to myself out loud, and hung my head over the open window on the passenger side. I'm so sorry. I heard some footsteps from behind and turned around. 
It was Captain Hayek and Color Sergeant Hayek Song, exiting the building and walking towards their car. As I watched them pull out of their parking space, someone tapped me on the shoulder from behind. I turned and saw three men in plain clothes, one of them sporting an Air Force Office of Special Investigations badge. Hi there, Sergeant. I'm Agent Williamson. These two men are with the National Scientific Intelligence Administration. They have a few questions about today's events, as do I, the agent explained. Before I could respond, the one with balding grey hair and wearing a white dress shirt pointed at Captain Hayek's car as it turned down the street and drove away. He said, Oh, and if you could... I'd like to know exactly everything you saw those two do the entire time they were here. Especially those two. It can be pretty difficult to decide on the kind of story you want to do sometimes. Well, I hadn't expected the popularity of Slice to grow the way it did. But, well, it did. I was just doing what I'd always done since I was a little girl, getting myself into trouble, getting myself out of it, and in the process acquiring that which I desired. Information. Ever since I could speak, people have been wanting to keep things hidden from me. I suppose it means I'm still childish if I admit that I can't handle being told no, but it's true. Dangle something in front of me so tantalizingly mysterious like that, and you'll soon find me obsessed with it. That's why I started Slice. It was originally just a little blog I wrote on using my old see-through Mac as a teen. I used it as part diary, part national inquiry for my neighborhood. Basically, a lot of people in my hometown who were aware of it became addicted to it. Others, well, let's just say they hated it. Understandably, I guess. But I mean, it's their fault for making themselves so interesting, for a lack of a better word. I guess I'll leave it at that. I'll spare you the boring details of how it led me to the kind of life I wallow in now. One of a contradictory, shut-in by day, extrovert renaissance woman by night. <laughs> Does that sound pretentious? It should, because it is. Those aren't my words, but that of my co-editor and business partner, Philip. Publicly, I have him run the company side of things. Legally, he's both the chief editor and founder, in order to conceal my preference for anonymity. I have two things that make me a better journalist than what you see out there in the pool of filth they call media these days. One, my legs. <laughs> and a good set of heels, I suppose. And two, the fact that those I deceive into narking on themselves have never seen my face before. Last week, Philip had texted me out of nowhere in the middle of the night. He wasn't interrupting my sleep or anything. I'd been up since four in the afternoon and still had that exhausted, disheveled look on my face, staring at my computer screen meticulously researching random, unimportant shit and generally wasting my own time. Me and him had been debating back and forth for a while now on what angle we should approach the upcoming IACS seminar from. You know... The same one where Monterey decided to turn the whole thing into, uh, let's see if I can start WW3, the movie. Well, I opened my phone and read his message as the light from the array of screens assaulted my retinas and danced over my face in the depths of darkness that was my apartment bedroom. So, try not to react badly to this, but, his text message warned, maybe we should explore something tangentially related to the seminar rather than the seminar itself. I let out a small cackle and shook my head in disbelief. I'd been trying for a month, to no avail, to get a job as a hostess where the seminar was being held, under a pseudonym, of course. For the last few weeks, I'd been consistently told by the employer that all positions are currently filled. Well, this flies in the face of what numerous former employees of the hotel had told me when I contacted them. They informed me that about two-thirds of the waitstaff were abruptly let go without warning a day after it was announced to them that the seminar would be held at their establishment. That's why I even tried playing in the first place. Hearing this lie told to me, 
I decided to check in at that very hotel for a night to see if it were true. And to my disbelief, it was. The hotel was being rung smoothly, almost surgically. The new staff seemed nice, in a uh, dystopian kind of way. It kind of felt like they were smiling at me only when I was actually looking at them. I had this strange sense they were scowling at me when my eyes were averted. Let me help you understand why this doesn't make any sense to me. They fired all the waiters, except those with the most time with the business. They fired all the cooks. They fired all the valets, except two. They fired the general manager of the hotel itself. I was told about the mass layoff the day it happened by a source. I applied a day after that. Within a day, they'd already filled all of those positions to their satisfaction. No wanted ads, seemingly no interviews, no listings on job sites, nothing. It was as if these new employees just showed up to work out of nowhere and started waiting tables or cooking steak. I'd spent the last few nights putting together a new fake ID so I could try getting another room on the last night of the seminar next week. I'd paid a lot of money to people on the dark web for this fake driver's license and Canadian passport. And now... Philip was asking me to give up and write about a safe, tangential topic vaguely related to space militarization. I texted him back. Sometimes I cannot freaking believe you. He did that thing when you're texting someone and they're typing this big-ass message, but you don't realize it, and as soon as you've hit send, they hit send, and... God, it's really annoying. Philip's still a boomer, you have to realize. He doesn't get technology yet. Or maybe he willfully refuses to understand it, like most old people. Well, either way, his giant wall of text that he sent me tried assuaging my anger. I'm not trying to stop you from pursuing the story you want. I would never do that, Clem. I mean, not anymore. Look, trust me, I learned my lesson with that whole fight we had over you narrating the weekly recaps. But... I think I have something better than the seminar itself. I might just have the reason behind the whole hotel staff business. Will you hear me out? I texted him back as I let out a long, frustrated sigh. Fine. What? And then I sent him one more. Oh, and it seriously better be good or I'm blocking your number for a week again. His reply read... I have this guy in Needles, California. Never heard of it? I told him. No, but it sounds like one of those crappy little towns between Barstow and Vegas that no one ever visits. Philip confirmed in his response. Well, it is one of those crappy little outskirt towns. But that's not the point. There was this whole supposed UFO crash and some sort of military helicopters came and took it away and blah blah blah. Philip, I am not doing a UFO story, I told him. I know, I know, his message read. That's not the point. There's this conspiracy theorist guy from Nevada. You know, one of those coast-to-coast -coast types. Anyways, he's been telling me he has some sort of bombshell information that connects the Needles crash with your seminar shadiness. I groaned, resigning myself to at least let him tell me. I'm listening. What is it? I asked. A picture appeared on my phone. It was an airliner sitting on a tarmac at dawn, painted lily white with a single red stripe along the fuselage, with no company branding or logos. What's with this airliner? I asked him in my text. Did you know that a Janet Airlines flight arrived at a private airport near Santa Rosa the night before everyone was fired, and offloaded the exact Number of people needed to replace everyone, Philip informed me. I was silent for a moment. I looked to the posters on my wall, drenched in neon purple light, taking inventory of what was just said to me. I texted him back one more time. Philip, you know I love you, right? Flash forward to the next day. I tried sleeping off some of my insomnia from 6 to 10 a.m. I tried getting up at quarter past 10 not having it. Then I tried 10.45. Again, absolutely not. 
So I did what I always do when I'm in a bind to meet with the source, and my circadian rhythm isn't cooperating with me. <sighs> don't judge. I mean, <laughs> please, don't judge. I mean, okay, well, I did a line. Yeah, I'm not proud of... You know what? I am proud of it. I mean, <sighs> look, either way, when a story like this is in front of me and my insomnia is in the way I... I don't have to justify this with you. And I'm not going to. After the white lady had gotten me out of my funk, I finally took a shower, got dressed and hopped in my car and headed down the road to the Silver State. Philip gave me the guy's address and phone number as I left the Southland. Frank Monterey, I said to myself out loud as I read the text. I pulled over and texted Philip back. Is that really his name? I guess so. No relation, obviously. Just one of those things in life, he said in reply. I continued on my journey northeast along the I-15, passing highway patrolmen, smart cars, and meth lab RVs along the way. Noticing the run-down watering holes filled with cheap signage, set in contrast to flashy, overpriced watering holes with pretentious signage, all posed against the backdrop of the California desert and its Joshua trees. Every now and then... I take a peek at the daytime moon piercing through the blue firmament gazing back at me. I wonder how hard it would get to be approved for a visit to Armstrong. Uh, I doubt I'd have the money, though. I kept glancing at it, wondering to myself, Are you looking at it too, Will? The coke's getting to me at this point, I think. I focus my attention on other things, turning the radio up. Let's see. Talk radio? You simply don't get what you're talking about. Like, explain to me exactly, it ain't socialism. If it's government, it's socialist. That's why the founding fathers gave us social security, to teach us responsibility. <sighs> no. Pop music? I pressed down on the seat button. The tired, millennial whoop burst through the speakers of my car. People who are 35 pretending to be 15, dressed in neon clothes, reciting their modern chant to their contemporary god. Nothing. Safe, marketable, inoffensive nothing. Now, where is this guy's house? I double check my GPS. Suddenly, it wasn't working. I hadn't been paying attention to it for a bit, and it was flickering back and forth between my car's position and where my destination was. Doesn't make any difference. I'm near the exit anyway. The satellite radio I was listening to began screwing up as well. I couldn't understand what the lyrics of the song were trying to say anymore. They were verbalizing something, but it was all mushy. I turned it off, as it strangely made me feel drowsy. I don't want to fall asleep at the wheel. I glanced back at the daytime moon again. What is that? I thought to myself. There was this black speck gliding along the rim of lunar spherical shape. It's not a bug. It can't be an airplane. Well, this is Nevada, I suppose. I'm liable to see a UFO at some point. I turned the view of my eyes back to the road, and finally took my exit. His house was a beat-up RV, not unlike the meth labs on wheels I'd mentioned earlier. He'd encamped himself on a slice of desert in an undeveloped part of North Las Vegas, not far from the gate of Nellis Air Force Base. I parked behind it and began texting Philip to let him know I was here, just in case this guy decides to chop my head off. If that happens, at least Philip will know where to find the skin suit he's going to make out of me. As I hit send, I heard a bang on my windshield, and then a dozen more in quick succession. There he was, fat, receding hairline, broken sunglasses, dirty polo shirt, and openly carrying a 9mm. Hey, you're here. You're the girl. You're the girl from the news people thing. Come on, hurry up. We gotta go. Come on, come on, come on. He screamed at the top of his lungs. I slowly got out, somewhat regretting not bringing my own sidearm with me. And I guess that's why you shouldn't take a hit to wake yourself up in the morning. I felt a sharp edge slightly press into my chest as I stood up out of my car seat. Good, I thought. At least I have my knife with me. Hidden in the one place he hopefully won't try to grope. 
I stuck my hand out to shake his as the guard door shut. Oh, nice to... He manhandled it like a maniac before I could finish. Yep, yeah, great, great. Look, we really gotta go, Dollface. They're gonna be here any minute, he spouted off. Who? I asked. Oh, Air Force Special Activity Center. Illuminati and Force Bureau. Really high-level dinosauroids. Far higher-level lizard people than even the governor, he shouted as he got into his RV's driver's seat and started the engine. Or attempted to. Several times. I was silent. Dumbstruck. You're Frank Monterey, right? I asked him. Shh. Don't say it out loud. Have you even run an evasion and recovery up like this before? <sighs> Quite clearly not, he shouted. The engine fully turned over and breathed life into the vehicle. I have no idea what you're talking about, I said as I reluctantly climbed into the passenger side. I texted Philip real quick to tell him that I hated him now. As the man shifted into drive, I looked behind me into the interior of the RV. You know, that meme from Always Sunny with Charlie, explaining all the crazy stuff on his wall and how it's all connected? Yeah, I should convince this guy to let me take a picture of him doing the exact same thing in front of all that stuff back there, because it will be a one-for-one. One. As implied, the RV's walls and windows were littered with a collage containing pictures of some spade-shaped aircraft, portraits of some women in Space Corps and Navy uniforms, a group photo of a few astronauts in their spacesuits in front of an American flag. Grainy photos of a bizarrely shaped satellite. Finally, there was an old Polaroid of a woman with an 80s style hairdo in a wedding dress holding hands with someone in a gorilla costume. The entire quote unquote modern art masterpiece was interspersed with the occasional classified military document and incoherently linked together with red string and thumbtacks. We're coming, we're coming now, he said as the RV turned onto the road heading north. He continued to say something under his breath. Oh, bitch. So, you bitch, you hag, you'll finally see what choosing Squatch over me really means. My jaw hung out for a few seconds as I just took stock of what I'd driven over four hours to get out here for. I just met a mentally ill stranger who uses the president's name as a pseudonym, stepped into his run-down RV willingly so that he can take me God knows where so that we can recover something from the government in order to steal his crush back from the Sasquatch. I checked my phone again to see if Philip had replied yet. I was going to tell him when I see him again that I am giving him a castration. But he hadn't responded to my last text. Or to the one before that, for that matter. I turned to Frank and asked, Listen, does this have anything to do with that airliner you told my business partner about? He cut me off before I could finish. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He motored off. We're going to get it. Oh, yes, yes, we're going to get it. Oh, man, <laughs> you won't believe how we're going to get it. Hmm. Okay, um, how are we going to get it? I asked politely. He then proceeded to pull his pistol out of his holster and wave it around in my face with a safety of. Good old American freedom. Hail Odin for the Third Amendment. I corrected him. Second. He began to talk over me. Uh, tenth. Anyways, you women never know you're wrong, especially when it's that time of the month, so to speak. Just like Sue. Oh, yes. My lovely old Sue. He looked over at me in that creepy old man. I'm about to sexually harass you, kind of way. My hand drew closer to where my knife was hidden. Oh, you remind me of her. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I now regretted the choice of clothing I'd made for that summer day. My legs pulled away and slammed into the door as he tried to place a hand on my thigh. I reached under my skirt and pulled the knife out reflexively. Before he could bring his hand back to where his holster sat on his hip, I instantly lunged over and pressed the blade just above it, directly into where his kidney would be, without breaking the skin. 
Keep your hands on the frickin' wheel, bitch. I screamed at him, my eyes tearing up in rage, my head and chest pounding from the adrenaline. The RV slowed down on the empty road we'd traversed onto. It was quiet. The RV stopped. He began to laugh. Ah, <laughs> Sue, our famous lovers' quarrels. We're not officially married until we have a few of those, I suppose. I looked at him in confusion and disgust. What is your problem, old man? I'm not your wife, or whoever you're talking about. I'm from the news group, remember? A tear ran down his cheek. He suddenly lunged towards me and started to shout at the top of his lungs. Sue, please God, just love me, not that ape. He tried kissing me as his free hand pulled my torso into him. I stabbed into his side with a knife, then again and again, and then one more time until he stopped moving. He was lifeless on top of me now. I pushed him off, some of his blood gushing onto my shirt and shorts. It was so thick that when I stood up out of the RV, it escaped the fabric of my clothes and ran down my leg. Not a good look. I collected myself, thinking about where I was on a back road in Nevada, a few miles away from my car. I could walk back to it, I thought to myself. I folded my arms as I leaned onto the door jamb, staring at his body, trying to get myself to stop shaking. I didn't cry, but I should have. How did you even come across that airliner? I said out loud, and lingered on the thought. I recalled the collage of conspiracist fuel he'd called wallpaper inside. Yeah, how did you come across it? I said again, out loud. I pulled my phone out and texted Philip before I climbed into the back of the vehicle. I need help now. Philip, I really need your help now. Please, call me, the message said. I started rummaging around all of his stuff inside. There was a strange version of the American flag draped on a small plastic table. It was white with blue stars and vertical stripes. It looked familiar, but I couldn't place my finger on it at the time. I looked underneath, finding a printout of a map. It showed a route from north and Las Vegas to Needles to Santa Rosa, California, and back. Did he actually go there? Did he take the picture himself? How did he know it would be there? I put it down and turned my attention to all the stuff on his wall. Who were these military women? Who were these astronauts? I unpinned the photo of the spade-shaped airplane from the wall and studied it. After a while, glancing up to the grainy picture of the strange object and letting it catch my attention, well, I pulled it down. It was shaped like... How? can I describe this? It's like looking at a 3D image without 3D glasses. I pulled down some of the documents, beginning to think that this may have actually been worth it. Well, kind of. If the red string was anything to go by, the document I was looking for right now had something to do with the uniformed young woman with the glasses. It was a transfer order of some sort from a few years ago. I'm not sure what the military would call it. It basically said this woman was to be released from the Air Force so that she may become a member of Monterey's new Space Corps. It said that she was to be promoted from first lieutenant to captain in doing so. It said her parent organization at the time was an intelligence squadron. Next to that, it listed her weight and height. And next to that, her social security number. Next to that, her last, well, then, first name. Hayek. As I pondered over her significance, I heard the fake Frank's phone go off. I walked over to the driver's seat from behind his slumped over corpse and struggled it out of his pocket. It was a text from someone named Will, which forced the image of the Will I know to the front of my mind, making me zone out. Another notification sound snapped me out of it. Where are you? They're almost here. 
This is the last chance for the We the People revolution. If we miss this window, I state this emphatically as Will Williamson, individual, sovereign, citizen of the Republic of Nevada, independent and sovereign, electronically notarized, documented permanently, in the year of our Lord in accordance with common law and not admiralty law. After reading that bit of nonsense, I went and scrolled up into the conversation they'd had over messaging and found the map coordinates of the destination Fake Frank was supposed to meet him at before I'd stabbed him to death. I decided that, well, since I'd killed him, it might as well be worth it to at least visit what he was taking me to. I collected everything off the wall and the table, save for the flag, and piled it together. I'd laid them on the passenger seats, got out and went around to the driver's side. I pulled his fat, smelly, stiff body out of its place with all my strength, nearly pulling my back out in the process. After he fell onto the asphalt of the road, I leaned over and removed his pistol from his holster. I checked the magazine. It was full. Placed it back in, putting the safety on. I got into the driver's seat he once occupied, and sped off to the location provided by his fellow freak. It took me another 30 minutes to get there. Civilization was far from here now. I was almost certain this had to border some sort of military range or government land of some type. As I arrived, I noticed a beat-up sedan with a faded paint job to the side of the road behind one of the safety barricades. I pulled up behind it and put it into park. I stared at it for a minute, seeing if anyone was there. After a while of inactivity, I got out to take a closer look. There was no one inside. There were more documents and folders in the back seat, however. And then I heard a voice call out to me. Hey, hey, he shouted. He was dressed like a hobo, standing by himself far away from the road in the middle of the desert, facing away from me. I squinted my eyes and realized he was urinating. He finished, turned around and began walking towards me, neglecting to put his thing away. Um, hello? I replied. He shouted back. Who is you? I could make out his crusty, sunburned face now. I'm a friend of Frank, I think, I said back. Who's Frank? He yelled back. You don't know... I looked down and realized it was still hanging out. Oh my god. Hey, look, your member's still out. He looked down and made an embarrassed face. Oh, look, <laughs> I'm sorry, he said in a strangely childish way as he fixed himself. I got the feeling he was a bit slow or low functioning. As he finally made his way over to me and came around the front of the car, he saw that I had a gun in my hands and began to panic. Oh, who, who is you? Why do you have that? Then he saw the dry blood on my leg and stains on my clothes, and he began to scream. Oh, jeez. You killed Will. That's why he ain't been back. Get away. I put the gun down on the roof of the car and tried calming him. Listen. Shh, it's okay. Listen. I didn't kill Will, okay? Someone tried to hurt me and I stopped them from doing that, alright? But it wasn't Will, okay? He relaxed slightly, trying not to look at me, keeping his eyes on the gun as he muttered, Okay. Listen, can you tell me who Will is or what you're doing out here all alone? I asked him in a concerned tone. He kicked some rocks at his feet and put his hands in his pockets. Well, Will said he was going to stop some dinosaur guys, take the rocket ship back and start the We People Revolution. I put my arm on his shoulder and questioned. Okay, and where did Will go? He said he's going to get the other American heroes and he'd be back, the poor man informed me. How long ago was that? I asked him. Since, um... The sun came up before the last time it was down and up, I, I think, he said, possibly alluding to yesterday morning. 
You've been out here for two days, I said, shocked. He shrugged his shoulders and said, I guess, as though he were a confused child separated from his mother. Before I could ask him what his name was, the sound of thundering engines broke through from over the horizon. Down the road, we could see a convoy. Three black SUVs, a white pickup and a semi-truck bearing an oversized load sign on it. On its trailer sat a large object, which I first thought was saucer-like in shape. However, the closer it got to us, I realized that it was only from the front, as it was much more spade-like from the side. Wait, is that the thing you was talking about? I said out loud. The poor, confused man in front of me got jumpy again all of a sudden. He pulled out a torn piece of lined paper and read from it. This is... This is what Will says would be happening. I got to do the revolt thing for, for Will. Before I could say anything, he grabbed the gun from off the roof of the car and ran out into the road, almost tripping over the barricade and falling on his face. He stopped on top of the median and raised the pistol to the sky and tried firing off a few rounds before he realized the safety was on. As he tried to figure out how the thing worked, the semi-truck pulled up in front of him and stopped. Two of the black SUVs flanked around the truck aggressively and stopped in front of it. Suddenly, hatches opened on each of their roofs, revealing a Gatling gun turret manned by what I assumed to be soldiers in black masks and tan helmets. A man got out of the passenger side of the SUV in front of me. He didn't have a mask on but he was equipped with a heavy-duty version of the military's new powered exoskeleton. I knew this because, well, some more mainstream journalists I'm acquainted with had been invited to a closed-door demonstration of it last year. He looked just like the one in the few photos they were allowed to take. If my memory served me right, the program that developed it was known as Invictus, which stood for something, though. I can't exactly remember what. He stepped forward in his suit towards the confused man. The torso of the suit resembles something an EOD might wear. In fact, I think those bomb disposal units were the inspiration for it originally. A plate of Kevlar jutted out from the chest area, protecting the man's neck and covering up his lower jaw. This plate of Kevlar had a black and white American flag sticker placed upon it, with some words etched into it that read, N-O-Y-F-B. Around his stomach area sat a small hollowed-out compartment built into his armour that provided a place where things like extra magazines and smoke grenades could easily be accessed by the wearer. From the right side of his body, there was a black, tactically dressed-up 12-gauge hanging in the air via a parachute cord. The weapon dangled carelessly near the grip of his palm with each step he took. From the pictures I'd seen... I recall that the wearer is usually supposed to be sporting a helmet of some kind, possessing all the night vision accessories you'd expect to see on a commando like this. However, this man did not have his with him. I could see his face from the mouth up, head shaved, either black or mixed race, hazel eyes. <laughs> it sounds cliche, but he had a prominent scar running down from his temple to the corner of his mouth. He stopped about six or so feet in front of him. His right hand became itchy, the servos in his exoskeleton girding his arm quietly, revving up and down as if they were imps begging their master to let them slaughter something. One of the men on the turrets called out to my confused acquaintance, Move or be moved. I could tell the poor guy had a lump in his throat at this point. He tried reading from the piece of paper he had, Gun still in hand. We, uh, we, uh, the people, uh, demands, he said through the nervousness consuming his face muscles. As he fumbled with his words, I could see the man on the turret was now becoming agitated. He shook his head and exclaimed to the man in the Invictus armor, Well, then, I guess you gotta move him. Suddenly he gripped the trigger area of his shotgun pulling down on it and breaking the parachute cord that held it. And then he did something I hadn't expected to see that day. 
Remember how in certain westerns or movies like Robocop, when the hero unholsters his weapon, he spins it around in the air as he brings his arm parallel with the ground? Yeah, he did that. One-handed, with a shotgun. The 12 gauge did one full rotation until it returned to its original position. The soldier quickly steadied it and fired a slug off into the poor man's confused face, killing him instantly. The recoil barely forced his arm up. The confused man's body hit the ground with a loud thud, relinquishing the pistol and his torn piece of paper from his grip. I watched as the breeze carried it away into the wasteland of southern Nevada. And that's when the soldier, or commando, or security guard, or whatever he was, turned his attention to me. He calmly walked towards where I was, stepping on top of the safety barricade that previously separated us. He pumped his weapon with the assistance of his other hand, and proceeded to point it at me now. I stood there, frozen. He asked in a cold tone, Who the hell are you? The man in the turret spoke. We don't care. We're on a schedule. Pump one into her and let's go. I tried bargaining with them for my life. Hey, listen. I said in a smooth... Oh, fuck off. I said in a soothing, somewhat sexual tone in an attempt to put their guard down. I then messed it up with, Please? As my voice cracked out of fear. I tried seeming cute and aroused to them. I forced a flirtatious smile out through my terror, bent my unbloodied leg at the knee towards them, and pulled my shirt down by the collar, revealing a portion of my bra. Oh, that'd be such a waste, sir. I said that bit with as much <laughs> suggestive energy as I could muster, considering the circumstances. And he didn't buy it. He smirked, chuckling a bit. <laughs> oh, really? I nodded as my breath became shorter. Uh, uh -huh. I said nervously, still smiling like an idiot. Well, no, he replied. A nasty smile covering his face. His index finger gripped the trigger. I turned pale, collapsing into a ball, covering my head with my arms in terror. I shouted, No, please. And then I heard a click, and nothing happened. I looked up from where I'd been cowering. He was still pointing that thing at me. He spoke. Well, would you look at that? All out of rounds. <laughs> he laughed at me. The man in the turret threw his arms into the air in frustration. Are you kidding me? He screamed at his compatriot. He turned the barrels of his weapon towards me. Ah, move. I'll do it. He commanded the soldier in front of me. My eyes widened. Jeez, how the hell do I get out of this? As he stepped down off the barricade, he looked into the sky behind me, as if suddenly something set his internal radar off. He squinted his eyes, looking past me, and pointed once he finally found it. I turned to see what it was. A small, faint grey dot off in the distance, flying in front of some clouds. I heard the man in the Invictus armour say, Oh, shit. Shit. They've been following us. He yelled at the man in the turret. I told you not to stop. And suddenly, they were all in a panic. They retracted their turrets back into their SUVs, the soldier running back over to the one he got out of and slamming the door as he got back in. The semi-truck started its engine back up, and the convoy sped off, leaving me to be showered by the dust they kicked up. The semi flattened the dead man, still laying there like roadkill as it escaped. I stared as it disappeared down the road. I pinched myself just to make sure I hadn't dreamt that part. What the hell is going on here? I said out loud to myself and to my dead friend over on the road. I turned around to see what 
could have scared them off. The grey dot was bigger now. A lot bigger, actually. It wasn't a dot at all. More like a boomerang or something. Was it a drone? Maybe. Well, they fly them out here in the middle of Nevada somewhere. It must be a drone, because I can hear his jet engine now. The drone was directly overhead of me now, banking left to make a turn. Just then, I noticed something gigantic appear in my periphery vision. It was a large blimp, I guess. I'm not sure, but I couldn't hear anything coming from it, so it had to be a blimp, I assumed. It was painted all black, but wasn't shaped like a traditional blimp, however. More triangular than oval. It emerged from inside a massive nimbus cloud, where I assumed it must have been hiding all this time. Was this what they were running away from? Soon, it completely escaped the ivory clutches of the cloud, and I could discern a series of turbofans mounted on the end of it. And that was the last thing I can remember before I woke up here. That's right, I blacked out. I don't remember what happened after that. I have a splitting headache now. Probably from all the adrenaline and fear of that day, but also probably from whatever drug was used to knock me out. If I was really knocked out, that is. Whoever it was that drugged me left me here in the terminal at McCarran Airport south of Vegas. I was cleaned up. My bloodstained clothes were replaced with some jeans and a button-up blouse I'd packed in the front of my car for the trip. I shudder at the thought of anyone undressing me while I was incapacitated. I looked around me. My computer bag I'd left in my car was there next to me. My purse was nowhere to be found, however. I had a combined airways ticket in my hand. My phone began to vibrate in my pocket. I pulled it out. It was Philip's intern. Hello? I answered it. Hey, boss. Did you get through security yet? He said over the phone. Um, yeah. Wait, what's going on? I asked him, still groggy. What are you talking about? He sounded concerned for me. Listen, I'm sorry about how weird this must sound, but can you just tell me what's going on? I demanded. Um, sure, I guess. You're about to take a flight home to SoCal because well, your car was stolen, he explained. And what else? <laughs> you may not believe me, but I really have no idea what's going on. I sounded desperate. He reassured me. Okay, okay, look, calm down. You called me yesterday night and said the conspiracy theorist guy never showed up and that, well, Philip wasn't answering his phone. Remember? I remember Philip not answering my texts. I ran my finger through my pastel hair, losing my mind. He continued. Well, I tried calling him, but he wouldn't pick up for me either. And he wasn't at the office or his house today. On top of that, his girlfriend said she hadn't seen him since he left for work yesterday. I'm kind of concerned, actually. Anyways, after I got done talking to her, you called me and said you were mugged after getting some burger paladin last night. You said the muggers stole your car and your purse. I was floored. Burger paladin... <laughs> I never eat a burger paladin. I hate that place. Well, I mean, I thought it was a little weird. I don't know many people who go there myself, he reasoned. He went on. Anyways, after that you had me go buy you a ticket so you could come home. Man, I hope Philip's not missing. Me too, I said nervously. Look, I need to do something normal to clear my head. Can you send me the script for the recap? I have some time before my flight starts boarding. Well, sure, I'll email it to you now, he affirmed. I thanked him and hung up. My heart was beating so fast, I thought I was going to pass out again. I needed something to eat. The food court was right in front of me. As I stood up from the bench, I realized I'd been sitting on a folder the entire time. I picked it up and opened it. My happiness returned for a fleeting moment. It was the stuff I'd taken out of Frank's RV. And if I am not mistaken, the stuff that was in that confused individual's car as well. 
the hell would they leave this with me? I ordered a few tacos from Hornets and a slice of pepperoni to boot. I sat down at the table and collected myself, opening my laptop as I crunched into the shell. I felt like crying. I started recording the weekly recap, beginning it with my signature line. This is Slice. This is your week. This is the world's week. Didn't take me long to finish it. They're not that extensive, usually. Never lasting more than five minutes. Things weren't looking too good in the world. A bunch of people were taken hostage in the Indian Ocean. The government was fighting itself instead of solving it. The IACS seminar had ended earlier than expected because of Monterey's announcement. The Chinese were telling the world they're prepared to wallop the US in space if they tried anything. I suppose the Space Corps, if it works as advertised, will solve the problem it created. I lingered on that thought. Space Corps? Who was it that I know in the Space Corps? That's right, that Captain Hayek woman. I reopened the documents I had with me. I went over her transfer papers again. I found another document detailing her assignment to the Air Force Special Activity Center after she joined the Space Corps. Now, didn't fake Frank mention something about that? I studied the files of these other two women, both enlisted. One who was transferred from the Air Force into the Corps. The other from the Navy. Horace, Jessica. Gregory, Amanda. Miss Horace was promoted from a technical sergeant in the Air Force to space system sergeant when she switched. Miss Gregory's transfer hasn't happened yet, but is scheduled for this upcoming week. What do these people do? What's their job? I searched for their unit's name on the internet. Interestingly enough, I came by a thread on a dormant BBS forum from the early 2000s. The author of the thread claimed that the AFSAC were the originators of the Men in Black urban legend going all the way back to the 50s. <laughs> I almost screamed in fright in the middle of the food court as I read the poster's username. Frank Monterey. It can't be. I quickly dove back into the documents splayed out in front of me. All of this was crazy. After action reports of AFSAC monitoring the daily routines of NASA astronauts, commanders' authorizations for invasions of privacy, including the taping of the astronauts' phone calls, breaking into their homes and installing spyware onto their electronics. A request asking for enough AFSAC agents to replace the wait staff at the hotel I tried getting a job at. Details of the government's dissatisfaction with this Black Star program. The aircraft I'd seen all those pictures of. One document calling it the XOV. And then this thing. This object. What the hell is it? It creeps me out to look at it for too long. There were additional photos of a damaged Chinese spacecraft. These labelled inadvertent shootdown. Wait a minute. Shootdown? I double checked to make sure where exactly this space plane was when it was shot at. I recognised the unfinished habitats behind it. Everyone in the United States had seen those paraded around by Hood Fisher in a bunch of different soft drink and fast food commercials throughout the year. It was New America. The future space colony. But that doesn't make any sense. I checked and rechecked the script I'd been sent for the weekly recap. Last paragraph. PLA officials also announced this week that an accident of some type has taken place at the site of the future state of New America, near Lagrange Point 5, that required the emergency re-entry of a small group of space vehicles. No further elaboration on the details of this event has been given at this time. I sat back in my chair and took stock of what the evidence was telling me. We shot at the Chinese in space. Just after the president announced to the world that we would no longer accept the presence of anyone else's military in said space. Now, the Chinese are covering it up. 
after threatening the president right back. I looked down and let my hair drape over my face as I rubbed my forehead, trying to mull this over. The headache was still getting to me. I resolved to get something more than just what I had in front of me. I sent Philip's intern my finished recording of the recap and asked him to file a FOIA request about this shootdown near New America. As I hit the send button on the email, I heard an airplane taxiing outside the window in front of me in the food court. A Janet flight. That's not funny. That's really not funny. Oh, God, you know what started all this? I watched as it approached the runway and began to take off. All I could think about was how much I hated this airliner. How much I hated not knowing why the Chinese were covering up the shootdown. How much I hated that man I killed and how much I hated myself for killing him. And I thought about how much Will would hate me. I picked up the picture of the damaged space plane once more. It can't be, I said under my breath. Oh, but it can be, I heard a voice say. I looked up as a balding old white guy in a dress shirt and sunglasses sat down in front of me, closing my laptop as he did so. Oh, excuse me, asshole, I said indignantly. Who the hell are you? Well, my dear Clementine. <sighs> Clementine Forrester, that is. I'm a snake person, <laughs> or a lizard, I guess. He revealed my own name to me as he laughed in my face. I watched two cops in plain clothes sit down on the table behind him, seemingly not paying any attention to us. My heart began to pound again. I was silent for a few seconds. How do you know that? How do you know my name? I asked. He expounded. Well, I mean... How couldn't I know? I'm the one who sold that passport to you, after all. In fact, I'm the one that set you up with Frank Monterey. And I'm the one that gave him all that shit you've been blowing your mind with for the past few minutes. And to top it all off, I'm the one who's going to get you on board one of those Janet flights so you can do some personal journalism for me. I narrowed my eyes and steeled my resolve. Tell me exactly why I would do a freaking thing for your ass. He cackled as he stole my slice of pizza, taking a bite of it. He swallowed and threw it back down onto my plate, leaning in as he rubbed his hands together and explained. Well, my dear, because I'm the only one who can get your business partner out of the proverbial and literal hole he's in. A shiver ran down my back. You didn't think you could just aid in a better known national security threat like yourself and get away with it, did you? He asked me. Well, at least I have my story now, I thought to myself. Yeah, so a lot of you might recognize that from way back in the day. That's probably four years ago when I originally did that. And uh, yeah, there were some issues with... Um, video footage that I used and so on and so forth. So it seemed like a good idea, a good opportunity to bring all of the various parts together and put them into one video. So yeah, that was it for this evening. Back with something new again very soon. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed that one. That was an old favourite of mine, so it was very nice to return to it. Uh, revamp it, uh, polish the edges and so on and so forth. So there you go. Friday evening, done and dusted. Back again. Sunday probably. I've got a lot of exciting things coming up, so I hope you're going to join me for some of the longer stories I've got coming. Really good stuff. Well, my dear friends, till next time, <laughs> very, very sweet dream. So bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye bye.